Welcome to this week's episode of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan, and as always, thank you very much for joining me. I have just finished my Day Gecko Vivarium build, so if that's something you've been following on YouTube, I'm finally finished. I have a bunch of editing to do, and the last part of the series will be out some point next week, hopefully. It's been uh, sort of a crazy amount of work and extremely stressful. My, the, the actual work itself was, you know, a lot of work, as, as most builds are, but it was a lot of fun for the most part. But the actual transition from moving my day gecko from one enclosure to the next was pretty stressful. She did not adapt to the new enclosure very well, which I sort of expected because she is a very timid creature. But uh, she's starting to do a lot better now. She's starting to explore and everything. But uh, there was definitely a few days there where I was very worried. So I'm happy that that is done. Uh, I have a bunch of other things in the work for animals at home. So I'm very excited to share that with you guys as soon as they are done. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to remind everyone that the official sponsor of the show is CustomReptileHabitats.com. I have links for that in the YouTube description as well as on the show notes. Any of the links there will take you right to their website. CustomReptileHabitats.com carries what I feel are the gold standard of reptile care. So we're talking the BioDude, Arcadia, Miss King, Universal Rock, Maximum Reptile. There's some amazing brands that are carried here. So if you're in the market for something new or you're working on a new project or getting a new animal, definitely go check them out. A commission does come back to me to help support the show. And also I do make a donation to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. My guest today is Mallory Lindsay of Miss Mallory Adventures. Mallory is a conservationist, an educator, a content producer. She really does it all. But what was really interesting about this conversation was that Mallory is in a situation that many of us are in. And that is you have a deep passion and a deep interest for animals and you really desperately want to do something with your life that's animal focused, but you don't have credentials behind your name. You're not a biologist. You don't have a PhD, you don't have a master's, you aren't a vet or a zookeeper, but you want an animal-focused life in some way. And, and that's how I am, and that's how Mallory was. And this conversation really reveals somebody who has that deep passion and just sort of made it happen despite not having an accreditation behind their name. Mallory has started some really cool online campaigns like Fear to Fascination, which is a campaign that shows people that a lot of those unlovables, as she calls them, reptiles and insects, are actually a lot more fascinating than you might think at first. She also has a campaign directed to asking people to go out into their backyard and, and explore there. I know quite often, especially when we're into exotics, we really want to, you know, look at the species in the rainforest across the world, but we often forget that there's some beauty in our backyard, and, and Mallory's trying to bring that back. I really enjoyed this conversation. If you're someone that's in the same boat as Mallory and I, and you don't have credentials behind your name, and you don't plan on going to school, and you, you're, you're kind of worried that you're going to get stuck with a, a life that isn't animal focused, listen to this podcast and, and just try to pick up some things that, the, that Mallory had said. There's so many different tips that she shares along the way. So enjoy the show and I will talk to you at the end. Today, I am joined by Miss Mallory. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pretty excited about this is actually my first uh, podcast interview. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. And yeah, I first ran into you when uh, you did a segment with Dave Kaufman at the Narciss Snake Dens. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a sort of giant breeding ground of garter snakes. And it's in the province that I live in. And I'm embarrassed to say I have never been there. Oh, my <laughs> so gosh. Really? Me, I've never been. I don't like... I need to go. I need to go next year or I, I could go in the fall, but I think it's better in the spring. So tell me what that was like. Uh, it was the like greatest eye opening experience of my life. I've, ne I've seen so I've seen like birds and great like my like, gatherings, you know, but to be able to see an animal that I used to be afraid of. And, you know, if I would see one snake on the ground, I used to flip and then being able to just like lay down quietly and you just have literally hundreds of these snakes crawling all over you, completely harmless, and being excited about it. It was such a surreal feeling like, oh my gosh, like this is everything that I've worked so hard for. So it was such a great experience for me. And of course, you know, Dave is amazing. And um, I highly recommend it to anyone. It's just one of those life-changing experiences for sure. Yeah, it's, I forget the numbers that they say are, are there, I, th I think it's tens of thousands. Yeah, yes. yeah, tens of thousands, and it's red, red-sided garter snakes. And you have, I'll, I'll post some videos of it in the show notes because there's some crazy videos, and it's just unbelievable when you see that many snakes crawling out of these dens. Yeah, and so next year I, I definitely want to go again. So 
next year, um, maybe you and I can go. Yeah, I'll go How with you. That be? Definitely. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. And we'll yeah. do some, it'll be, uh, so I'm starting a series called My Backyard Adventures. And so you can show me your backyard, which okay. will be the narcissist snake den. I can't believe I have the biggest snake breeding thing on the planet in my backyard and I've never been. So we'll make that uh, segment happen then. I would love that. It's like, in, if anybody's ever seen like Indiana Jones, it just reminded me of that for some reason. Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely surreal when you look at the video. So let, let's rewind the clock a little bit, because as you said earlier on, and plus in your in your uh, bio on your website, when I was reading it, it's you, you claim that you were afraid of reptiles when you're younger, which is sort of the opposite of many reptile people, because most reptile people are like the kind of the weird person that is willing to touch the <laughs> snakes. You, you almost have the opposite story. So tell me tell me about that. Sure. So growing up, um, my family wasn't very outdoorsy in the slightest sense. Um, and I grew, I had all my information from old wives tales when it comes to reptiles and amphibians and Hollywood. So it wasn't a very positive experience. And growing up, I loved animals, but just the reptiles, it was, I was that stereotypical, like, oh, they're going to attack me, that kind of thing. And it wasn't until I was 16 years old, I needed a job. No one would hire me. And I went to this pet store and I remember, uh, I found out he wasn't the manager, so he couldn't have hired me anyways. But he he's like, you know, what? I'll give you a job, but um, you guys stick your hand in these bags of snakes. And I was like, that's not going to happen. I was like, don't you have a cashier job or just something that I don't have to touch any kind of slithery, slimy thing? And uh, he's like, nope, you got to pick up a ball python. And so I stuck my hand inside and I remember being so terrified that it was going to bite me. And when I pulled it out, I was just completely captivated by this like little baby ball python. And I remember looking down and I had seen that it actually did bite me, but it didn't hurt. And after that, I was just completely just fell in love with reptiles and all these kinds of myths and misconceptions that I had grown up with that I really wanted to um, debunk. So that was kind of the whole thing started the journey. So that, that's really amazing. So it was almost like in the moment, your fear completely melted. Like in a snap. Uh, it was like that, that sense of realizing that everything, I think everyone kind of goes through these where you realize you are wrong and you kind of just admit it. And then all of a sudden you become fascinated by it, which is um, why the campaign's called Fear to Fascination. Right. I hope everyone can have those little moments. Yeah, it's like a total seismic shift in the way you've perceived the world up until that point. And yeah. It, and it's interesting because so many people have that experience with reptiles. I mean, I, I have snakes. So many people were like, if you get snakes, I'm never coming to your house. That's ridiculous. And then it does not take them long to touch a snake or even look at it. And they all have a similar experience. Maybe they don't fall in love with it where they want to get one of their own. But it's like, this is not at all what I thought. And I think that's why it's so important to have positive uh, people who are educating and I say in a positive light, you know, instead of going and doing that wow factor, that shock factor, really go after that, how amazing they are and, and creating those experiences. Cause that's what I, my firmly believe that it's stories and moments that create that fear. So you need stories and moments to kind of negate that fear and, and switch it to that fascination. So, you know, people like you who are excited to share your reptiles are exactly what we need in this world. Yeah, there's totally so many stories. And, and I think there's always a little bit of inherent fear that just almost is naturally within us about snakes. Like even when my a snake hisses at me, for example, like it still kind of gives you like chills, you know, you're like, oh, like, sure. <laughs> so and it, that's but, like your body reacting to um, that, like evolutionary fear, right? That yeah, um, to be safe. So. Yeah, it's like the sound of a big cat, like growling or roaring like a panther or something or a leopard. It just gives you like, whoa, that could that could get me. But it but again, <laughs> it's just breaking through that. that that's so cool. So even at a young age, obviously, you were you were you loved animals. Did you want to have a career that was surrounded by animals or or did that happen? just serendipitously or, or t tell me about that. Um, I think everyone wants some like really crazy, cool dream growing up. Mine was, I think I wanted to be a teacher. I just, I always wanted to be whoever I was idolizing at the time. So one minute it could have been my, my mom. Next minute it could have been a teacher. Next minute it was a doctor. But um, I think I always loved learning. And so innately, that's what I wanted to do as I got older. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So and then it, in terms of besides the pet store, what was the first sort of pet or, or animal kind of related career that you went after? So I actually didn't really go into like the wildlife until I became a wildlife rehabber. I moved to Tennessee to go to school. 
and I needed kind of an internship. So I went to a wildlife rehab center and, and that's something I highly, highly, highly recommend anyone who loves animals, but don't know really where to start in the animal career is go volunteer. And so I went and did that. And I think that is where I just developed that love as well for that wildlife myth busting with wildlife. Um, I was always terrified of like possums and raccoons and I'm still not the biggest fan of squirrels, but um, <laughs> I think that uh, was really what kind of built everything up and really taught me how much education and self-education especially is so important in this and developing your career. So tell me about that wildlife rehab and because I know on your, on your bio, it's wildlife rehab and first responder. What does that mean? Oh, so um, there probably should be a comment right there. Um, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a wildlife um, rehabilitator, and I'm also a wilderness first responder. Okay, so yeah. um, that makes probably a little bit more sense. But uh, the wildlife rehab part, I anybody, I think it's super important if you do want to work with even exotics to get to know your local wildlife because that teaches you so much more when you do dive into the exotic field. Um, some of the things are very similar, but also it's also a great pathway to work with things that are different. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. It's very cool. And uh, it is great to learn about what's around you because you, you, you it, it is true that especially when you like exotic animals, you kind of forget about what's around you. And so your native wildlife. And I know that's one of the things that you kind of go after with the, your sort of backyard adventures. So is that kind of what is that what it's called backyard adventures? I think so, right? My backyard adventures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. is that kind of what stirred that to, to sort of create that is to inspire people to to look at what's around them? Yeah, um, you know, working. I also worked at a zoo. I was a director at a zoo, and I realized that the more I s would just sit and watch, the more I learned that I couldn't find in books, as far as like behavioral wise, as far as um, things that they really liked. You know, we read things. And there's so many opinions that are kind of mixed in with that. That when you really are able to watch something, so when you have an exotic animal and you can find something that's similar in your local wildlife, being able to study that firsthand. Um, will teach you so much about the animals that you want to maybe keep um, as pets that are exotic. Yeah, there's so much you can learn without having to go become like a biologist or a, some sort of, you know, getting a university degree or getting your master's or PhD. There's so much you can do without having to go that route. There's so many people that either can't afford to go to university or just don't want to go to university. And there's, I think some people just assume that if you can't go to university, you can't have a passion in, in animals. Absolutely. Uh, I, that was, has been my, my biggest um, weakness, I felt. I, I've lost a lot of opportunities as far as like hosting TV shows because they wanted that acronym at the end of my name. And I never, I had, a, they call it imposter syndrome, I think, mm -hmm. where you just never feel like you're good enough. And it was always because I didn't have that degree. But what it also makes you do is become creative. And because if you don't have this degree, you find out other niches that you have that maybe someone else couldn't fill. And I think that's really important for people to not be self-conscious about that and to be creative. It may take a little longer to get to where you need to be, but it's not, you know, that's not the same path for everyone. Totally. And I, I completely agree. And that's what really what I wanted to kind of get into with you is because there are so many people that are in that same boat. And so how, do, how did you do that? How did you create this wildlife educator career in, in a position like you said, like without those credentials behind your name, it's definitely harder to to jump into that field. Oh my goodness, so harder, uh, so much harder. So I always want to tell everyone, believe in the law of averages. So I actually, in the very beginning, would send out about 50 emails a day to any organization, any researcher that would be willing to um, let me follow them and kind of tell their story. And most of the time, I'd either get a no or no response. And the biggest thing is don't give up, obviously, and be super creative. No one's going to believe in you more than yourself. So if you're not willing to put the, what, how has that saying go? Something to the pavement, the, uh, <laughs> the tires to the pavement, or you just yeah. make it work, then no one else is, why should anybody really give you a chance? So I think that's the biggest thing is. Yeah, no one's just going to jump out and say, hey, do you want to do this? So when you were doing that, what, what were you looking for? Like what, obviously you were looking to create some kind of like an, um, I guess, were you trying to film film people discovering new things with wildlife or, or what was your vision at that time when you were just mass emailing people? Oh my gosh. Um, to be completely honest, I didn't even have a vision. Like you, everyone, I it used to always bother me when people would say like, oh, I knew this is exactly what I wanted. For me, it was literally like this like a tumbling creek that would like crash over here and be a dead end and then like flood over here. And 
it was never a straight path. So it was more of, I loved learning. I loved sharing stories. And so you'd go a little further and then you would realize by your demographic, what do they like listening to? And then you'd kind of steer your stuff a little bit to there. And so it was always, it's just a constant evolving thing. I honestly can say it's taken me about eight years. And now I've finally kind of had this very like solid, clear message slash mission that I'm working on. Mm. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of time just to even refine, like exactly like refine the foundation that you're standing on. Like you, you and I, I was in the same boat too. Like I don't have a degree in biology or anything. And, and it was sort of the same when I started this, it was like, I need some kind of idea of what I'm doing. But you just kind of have to feel it out until you start collecting a better image and better picture of what it is you are and what you're trying to promote. Right. And you are a phenomenal like reporter. You're the one that can go and find these people that are the experts that do have this knowledge and bring it back and kind of get the, the juicy little tidbits and then give it to your followers. And so that is the niche that you found, which is incredible. We need more of those kinds of people too, who are willing to not take that expert seat and being willing to be the, the shares, those educators. Totally. And it's, it's, there, there is value in that. And that's one of the things with academics is quite often they're not necessarily interested in doing the communication side because they're stuck doing like they are super busy doing their own things. And to even bring a, you know, a research paper down to the level of the layman that makes sense and makes people interested in what they're doing. It's not something that they're interested in. It, was there a moment that you because obviously you said that you love to learn. Was mm -hmm. there a moment that made you realize you love to educate? I think it was when I became so excited about learning. And then when I was able to share it in a way, <clears throat> ah, yes, I know the exact moment actually. So I was, um, I was going for a run and it was in Southern California and I came across this rattlesnake and, you know, five years ago, the rattlesnake would have terrified me, but I stopped and I was just watching it. And, um, a little girl comes running up and she sees it, she flips and I just, gave her maybe three or four facts, you know, about how it's okay. And it's great to watch them and that kind of stuff. And then her mom came up and started freaking out. And then she was able to tell her mom and her mom calmed down. And then her mom told her sister. And so seeing like this progress of events, I was like, wow, what a great ripple effect that we could have when we educate. And that was when I was like, you know what, maybe it's okay to not have a degree or maybe not go to that research field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you definitely don't need it. It's it, exposing people to some new information is you can do it in any way. Um, yeah, look at you. I mean, a podcast, it's a phenomenal way to be able to reach people. So it doesn't, if you don't want to be on camera, you don't have to. Um, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah there, there's all sorts of ways to do it. And so for, for you, and you've developed all these different, um, really interesting things like the fear to fascination. Obviously, we've kind of touched on that as well. And, and then also you have sort of classified as the the unlovables uh, on your yes. website. Which is, so I guess I'm assuming mostly that's like your reptiles and your insects. What yeah, was, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask why, what, what makes you really focus on those specifically? Like what, what do you love about helping people through those fears? Oh my goodness. I guess because it reali I really realized how wrong I was about wildlife. And I found out that some of these creatures that we kind of like cringe at and don't want to learn more about have the most phenomenal fairy tale, cool stories in the animal kingdom. I mean, for instance, like the hagfish, who is this like primitive jawless fish that can shoot out these like slime threads, like, like if Spider-Man and a flubber had a, a kid, like that would be the hagfish. And you just have these like really incredible animals that people should know about because these animals are also becoming part of science to help resolve issues that humans can't on their own. Additionally, that's so fascinating. Are, are there other, other than the hagfish, are there other, some of those animals that kind of are in your top list of uh, interesting unlovables? Oh my goodness. Yes. I mean, I can give you, I can shoot out. 15 right now. But I think right now what I'm learning about is called biotherapy, which is the use of organisms in healing uh, wounds and different things. And for instance, leeches are being used uh, as a medical device or USDA approved medical devices. And they're being used when like, say you cut off like a, a ear or a finger, or you get a skin graft, those capillaries are cut. And they're so small that surgeons can't reattach them. So they'll stick a leech on your finger that was just chopped off and it will reestablish those capillaries through the sucking, the suction power. 
that's incredible. An animal that we like loathe and think it's so gross is saving appendages. And you have maggots who you have this like necrotic wound that science, uh, that science, sorry, doctors aren't able to debride properly and, and heal. You stick maggots in there, they will clean that sucker and make it pink and pretty, and it's healed in you know six to eight weeks. So that's just so cool. I just I don't know. I think other people should know about that too. Oh, totally. Yeah, because when you're ex typically when you're exposed to maggots in uh, the everyday life, it's in a horrible situation. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, yeah. Are, so it's, it's good to know some interesting facts. Um, and I, I know that. So, Obviously, bugs. If if rept if you were freaked out by reptiles originally, I'm sure like the tarantula and the cockroaches were not on your list of favorite animals as well. Definitely not. Um, it was <laughs> um, cockroaches. I can't remember when I finally liked them. I think I learned a fact that only one percent were actually pests, and the rest were really beneficial. And I found I had a giant jungle cockroach fall on me when I was in Belize one time while I was going to the bathroom, and. Uh, number one, just so if I was wearing, <laughs> and um, and I just remember like freaking out for a second, and then just taking the time to look at it. And I was like, "Whoa, this thing is so beautiful!" So I think that when we finally make that switch, where instead of approaching something with fear and anxiety, if you can just take a moment to take that breath and know it's not going to hurt you, and look at it with curiosity. That I think will just change everybody's perspective on, on a lot of these animals. Yeah, totally. I'm still Especially in the spiders. Yeah, definitely spiders. I'm still in the uneasy section of the room for the insects. Like, yeah, I see you touching them and holding them, and I don't. There's something about it that still freaks me out. So I think I need to learn some more facts before I go and reach my hand in. Um, it's uh, when you do your fear. To, I know you do lots of the educational stuff with classrooms and kids and whatnot. So for the fear to fascination, is it most? Are they mostly spiders, snakes? Is that the kind of the top uh, culprits in terms of the kid, things that kids are f afraid of? Yeah, and when doing our presentations, one, I'm never home to have like a really cool collection of things, but we want things that are relatable. So when they do go home and they do see something as similar, they know how to react to it. And they know how to be like, oh, that's not scary because we only have black widows or brown recluses. And obviously that's a, not one of those. So um, for education, I know a lot of us focus so much on those like cool, super flashy animals, but so many kids want to be able to relate. And so when you can kind of maybe keep those things to things they can see in their homes, that's just exciting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So do you, you bring live animals to those events, I guess. Do you, do you have to catch like wild bugs that are around the area? Sometimes, uh, sometimes we make it an adventure where we all go out and oh, we'll go cool. catch these animals, which I think is really neat too. So you're also giving them tools how to properly flip over logs and, and look under things and pick up things and um, observe things. And I think that is a, 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 such an important tool for kids too, because so many of them don't know how to do that. But um, as far as bringing them, if I'm local, I can. But because I'm on an airplane a lot, right. I don't think people really want a lot yeah. of cockroaches on the airplane. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but I love that. That's so cool. Teach, teaching the kids that. And because one of the videos that you had posted, I think on your Facebook was talking about, I forget the person you're with, but you guys were in that stream with those giant salamanders. And we're talking about just stacking rocks and how dangerous that yeah. is. For, can you t just kind of run through the, just like a little spiel about, because just as you said, you know, Turn, like learning how to properly flip over logs and whatnot. There's actually a proper way to move through the environment. Absolutely. You know, of course, we always say we don't want to disturb things, but what does that really mean? And when I went with scientist, um, his name's JJ, and he's with, um, I believe it's Associate Director of ARC, which is the Amphibian and Reptile Conservancy. It's so great to go into the wild with a professional because they kind of show you things that you would never have even thought of. And um, as far as like the stacking of rocks, he was showing me how the hellbenders, the males will create these dens and they are actually external fertilizer. Um, it does external fertilization. So they like spray these eggs full of sperm and they just kind of like pack up on the rocks. So when you start disturbing these things, it is going to cause ruckus on these nests. And me personally, I was like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, I knew that's how they did it, but I never thought of just moving this rock could cause so much disturbance. And so I think um, it's good to go into nature and to enjoy it, but it's also really good to 
understand things on a much smaller level. So you know that, oh, that's, that could possibly be someone's home or someone's food or something like that. Yeah, no, that that's very interesting. And I know the other thing that you like to do is uh, tackle some, you kind of mentioned it already, some of those myths that are out there, it's just wildlife myths in general. What are some of the favorite myths that you've busted or, or helped kind of expose to people? Oh, um, we try to do local stuff. So my, my biggest love uh, are possums, opossums, I should say, and how essential they are as far as eating the ticks and the bugs and they look super scary and look really kind of gross, like, like a giant rat, but they are so important. And I'm, are people not guess, typically fans of possums? Like when they see them, are they scared? Oh, they think they're or? disgusting, at oh, least okay. in the city. So it's funny how a lot of wildlife people, they're like, of course, you know, opossum, everyone should love an opossum or at least not be bothered by it. But if you had no idea what the role of an opossum was and you saw this like nasty i mean they look pretty gnarly with their they big do. old teeth and they drool you'd like get that thing out of my backyard and so um but really the biggest myths that i've encountered have actually been with uh, educating uh, the more and more i learn is that many educators think that they need to constantly talk and the biggest thing is actually to listen when you can someone wants to be heard and so when you can uh, listen to them and kind of see their perspectives, then when you teach them about the wildlife, then you can actually debunk their personal myths, which is, I think, much more impacting. Right. Everybody has their own myths that they build up in their heads, and you will never hear it from them unless you let them speak. Absolutely. Yeah. So in terms of what your like, day-to-day life is like, like, what is like a month in the life of you because it seems like you're always traveling you're always on the road doing different things how are you setting things up is it sort of the same thing you're contacting people and asking if you can go out to research projects and whatnot yeah much like you uh you just kind of you're always just making sure those wheels are going and a lot of times they don't end up anywhere and so you just have to keep making sure you always have your hands uh, in different pots as far as different um scheduling i think a, a big thing that many people feel like they need to do is they need to have a career in conservation. And I have what I call my big girl job, which um, pays pays my bills and allows me to do my conservation things. And I do make a little money with the conservation stuff. But then what was great about it is it doesn't become like, oh, I got to pay my bills. And, and so th- I think that is um, really important. But as far as my day-to-day life, it, it's all different. I just take a, try to take advantage, always move forward and always planning, lots of yeah. planning. Yeah, it's, it's very true. Like that's a really good point that if, if you don't have to have all the eggs in that basket, you can be a little bit more relaxed about it and you can enjoy it and go after things that you really want to do rather than things that you just have to feel like you have to do because you're like, mm-hmm. I need to make this paycheck and, what, and whatnot. So when you go on these things, when you do have are fortunate enough to go and can, you know, on a research project and whatnot, like I know you recently went down to the, I think, was it in Georgia where you did some work with the loggerhead turtles or? Yeah, Wasa, yeah. I think I say Wasa. it right, pronounce it. Wasa, yeah. How was that? It. Um, it's great. Um, if anyone ever wants to have, and I know I say this with the snakes too, and but they're all life-changing experiences. But if you want something that's going to like make you just completely rethink the way that you use plastic or um, spend your money on conservation like that, do this is called the Coretta Research Project is a citizen science project where you actually go on this beach with researchers and you are literally in the sand measuring these turtles, pulling out these nests to, um, to count, you know, eggs that haven't hatched. And it's super hands on science. And I think more people need this kind of connection because it is, so empowering and you feel like you're really part of that conservation and it's one of the oldest sea turtle research organizations in georgia against coretta research project and golly it's just i wish everyone could experience that because it's i mean i i get emotional and i've done it i've seen probably 50 turtles already yeah so so what what do you do you're there for you're only there for a few days i think right just maybe like four or five Uh, days you're there for a week at a time when you become a volunteer Mm -hmm. and 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 then so on a day-to-day basis you're sort of uh help like finding turtles helping them measure like what do you do there so uh when it's nesting season 
Now you have to wait until the nighttime. So the females come up and basically you're patrolling these beaches up and down. And when you see the female come up, you wait till she digs her nest and then she goes into a trance when she starts laying. And that's when you get to go in and measure. And what they're doing is they're just making sure they're, they're collecting numbers as far as nesting females, who's coming back to the beaches and just do adding to this like very long data collecting a survey that they've been doing. But, um, so yeah, it's why, just, why does oh. it, what, what is the emotional response coming from? Like, why, why do you get emotional about it? You read about these animals and you see them on TV and you watch these documentaries, but when you are sitting beside this I don't, like, prehistoric species, um, it's, you don't realize how big they are until you're beside them and their heads are like this big and you're, you see how difficult it is for this female to lug herself onto the ocean, uh, out of the ocean, dig this nest. And you know that there's predators in the forest just ready to eat them. And she, she does this without even thinking. And it's just, I don't know when you really kind of absorb the miracles of nature, it just makes you want to just be a part of it and save it even more. Yeah, it's like you get a a glimpse of the like the soul of this animal. It's like this duty that she has to go through, and she just grinds through all this work, and it doesn't matter what, she, nothing will stop her. It's that's really it, amazing. It's true nature at its rawness. I mean, we we watch things in parks and stuff like that, but when you're on a beach, there's not a single soul around you. You just have the stars and the moon, and you see the blackness of the ocean, and you just see this incredibly giant marine reptile. It's just pretty awesome. It's yeah. a pretty amazing experience. Yeah, I bet it is. And I, I've never seen a loggerhead, but I've seen green, uh, green, sea, uh, sea, uh, green sea turtles in, in, uh, in Hawaii when I was snorkeling. And I was oh, really so amazed cool. how huge they were. Like you, like you said, you don't know how big they are until you're close to one. And it's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really just an incredible experience. And, and I know we kind of touched base on this a little bit before, uh, when you're trying to get involved with a lot of these organizations, if that's something that your your listeners are wanting to do, highly recommend always give more than you take with these organizations. Prove yourself to them, and then that is when they're willing to open to more ideas that you may have. I think that's one lesson that I learned too, a little too late. <laughs> well, it's better late than never. <laughs> yeah, I missed out on a lot of opportunities, but... That was one lesson I try to tell all the, the newbies that are coming into the conservation realm. Yeah, no, that's a great tip because you're right. There is a, a giant lineup of people that want to do it. There's mm -hmm. a huge amount of animal lovers that want to get in there. So you, you do really have to make sure that you're standing out in some way. So what are some other of the, uh, obviously you've been to quite a few different places, Narciss and Georgia and whatnot. Are there any other ones that come up on your list of like really favorite memories or experiences? Absolutely. So one of my very first conservation experience was actually in Belize. I had, we're working with the Hicketee, which is the Central American river turtle. And what's really great about the species is that it's actually being eaten to extinction. Um, it's, it's um, eaten on Easter, same way we kind of eat turkey on Thanksgiving. So it's very, a huge part of their culinary culture. But uh, I'd never been to a foreign country before, and I'd never worked, known how to work a camera before, but I called this organization up and I was like, listen, I want to tell your story. I think it's amazing. Um, will you let me? And um, I think that was a, the, kind of like the spark that was like, this is what I want to do. I have no idea what I'm doing, but this is what I want to do. So I want to, I want to go back to that moment. So when, when you did that and they said, yes, what, was there like, did you have that sort of gut feeling, like a sinking feeling where you're like, oh my God, now I have to do this. Like, were you really, were you Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like everything, it's amazing how like everything sounds so great in your head. And then when you have to finally make it work, you're just like, how am I going to do this? Yeah. And, uh, I made every mistake uh, possible, but they, I think they realized one, I didn't charge anything, which was a very a smart thing to do when you're starting off. You're yes. going to have to do a lot of that free stuff. And, but I think they realized that my heart was in it. And so they gave me more opportunities. And then you just dive in to make sure that you don't make that same mistake again. You'll definitely make more mistakes, but just making sure you don't make that same mistake again. Do you, were there some mistakes that you remember that you made that would be helpful for people that would be kind of going into the same situation? Or is it sort of just like you got to experience it? Oh, no. Um, so one of my biggest ones is, and uh, definitely don't, um, 
don't lie about your skill sets. I mean, don't cut yourself short, but don't promise something you can't deliver. Always try to impress and impress with your actions, not with your words. And I think that is probably the biggest thing that I learned. And to um, don't put too much on your plate. That's a really big one too. And um, I think I think those are the two big ones. Never give up. You will be told so many times that it's not possible and just keep trying and keep coming up with different options. And you might piss some people off, but some people will say yes. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's really amazing. Like um, in terms of your experience at the time, you I'm sure like filming, did you have much experience or you're just like, I'm just going to go and figure it out as I as I'm there? I bought a DSLR camera and I didn't even know what DL DSLR meant or uh, the difference between RAW and JPEG or what's 1080 or any of that stuff. In fact, I think the first like 30 minutes I was filming amazing footage. I was so excited. I didn't even have like the audio on. So it was, it's, again, so many mistakes and it just keep trying and not letting that get you down um, every time you do make a mistake, which I'm still trying to learn how to do myself. And I'm sure you are too. You know, oh, you're yeah. always learning something new with the podcast. Yeah, it's uh, well, for one, there's a tremendous amount of courage and bravery to just do that, to just put yourself out there and just get, I know I'm going to mess this up in some way. I don't know how I'm going to mess it up. Something's going to go wrong. And so you have to just kind of figure it out as you go. And and, and yeah, that, that is what you, you know that it, the first round is not going to be perfect. And it's just about learning and, and getting yeah. that experience the hardest stride is always going to be that first one. Yeah, no, that's uh, so obviously it, it was some kind of success though. You had, uh, you, you learned a lot and then you brought, did you bring back some footage and uh, did you post that somewhere? Uh, so no. Um, so that's one another thing that I am a huge uh, pansy about is posting things because I'm always critiquing it. You know, we're always our worst critic and, totally. and I'm sure that you've gone through that too, where, you're like, oh, I don't want to post this podcast or I don't want to post this whatever because it could have been better. But um, no, I haven't posted. I posted one picture of the Hickety and I should really, I'm going to start going back. I'm starting a new YouTube blog and we'll start going back and using those examples as teaching tools as well. Yeah. And I think that's a huge part of it is, is people need to like that. That is it's not perfect. The fr it, when you see somebody on YouTube that's well polished, you think like, wow, they're just they've done it all. But they, there's always that several years of just grinding. And, and it does take that sort of just sort of jumping into the deep end and hoping that it kind of works out. Yeah, and I'm sure it's with um, with you as well. Have you noticed like the way you articulate and the way that you can kind of come up with questions and interview? Has that substantially improved? Would you say about yourself? Oh, definitely. Like that's for sure improved. And I, I remember my very first podcast I recorded with somebody. I was like insanely nervous and just so scared. And, <laughs> and I still do get every time I record a, a podcast. I still do get nervous before. Like just I, but I kind of like that. Like I like having a little bit of. Um, excitement before I go into a, to a recording. But yeah, there was definitely early on, I was not the best at it. So it, it takes time. Right. And I, and you can't, I mean, I get, I, I get hate mail a lot and I say a lot, but there's quite a few people who are saying very negative things and you, you just can't let that get to you either. I mean, it's, it's hard enough that you're your own critic and then you have social media, which is the biggest bully out there. Yeah. So it's definitely can't let that get you down. Yeah, it's it's the the whole online communication is um, it's pretty brutal for the most part. And actually, I don't know if I if you've seen this, I'll, I'll have to send it to you after I did a podcast with somebody that wrote a, a fairly negative comment on one of my videos. And this this person actually was willing to come on and she was a younger kid. So it, we had a really pleasant conversation, but it was all I wanted to show was the fact that most of the time, if you were to have a face to face conversation, that comment would not have happened. You know, like people behind their keyboard just get mad and they just so so partly as the reader of the comment, you just go, well, whatever, you know, like they, they might be having a bad day. And as the people read it, leaving the comments, they also need to you know, second guess, like maybe I shouldn't write this, but we haven't got there yet in society, I don't think. But I think what you did was incredible. Instead of like arguing back, you invited them, which gives them, of course, you know, some empowerment, but it also allows a conversation to be created instead of just constant conflict. And that's amazing what you did. I, I, I think I'm aided in the fact, 
Well, I hate typing. I just hate it. Like I hate typing <laughs> on my by phone. Default. <laughs> yeah, it just I, I hate typing. I hate texting. I hate all of that. So it's just so much easier for me to speak. So it's like I'm not going to go back and forth with this person. If they're willing to chat, then that's great. But yeah, so it, it there's definitely a lot of hurdles. It, being online is less glamorous. It obviously has uh, tons of rewards, and I'm sure you get lots of positive feedback as well from people. I'm sure they reach out to you. Uh, yes, especially like the moms with the kids who you see them like exploring their backyards. I think that's probably one of my most favorite. And uh, I think as an educator, that's what you kind of live for. And I'm sure you you really value those kinds of feedback, that kind of feedback as well. Oh, yeah. And there, there's nothing better than working with kids as well. I, I work with kids in my actual job that's separate from this. And it's it's I just I love it. And I'm sure that's the same experience that you have. Uh, yeah, uh, I had one mom come up to me who said, you know, my little girl loves bugs, but she's kind of becoming more and more hesitant about that because all the girls and some of the boys make fun of her. They say that girls shouldn't play with bugs. And so we went on a hiking trip and we were able to go and do like a girl only bug collecting trip. And we also found some snakes as well. And I think stuff like that, that one on one connection like you're doing is so important for our youth. They can watch stuff on YouTube. They can see things on TV. But when you can create those connections, that's what's going to be making that difference. Definitely. No, I totally agree. So uh, at home, you have, what's that? I said, so props on you. I think oh, it's fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, kids. thank you. And, and same, same back to you. I, I think that's uh, we're definitely starting to make a difference. So that's good. And, and like kind of what you said earlier, it's moving away from the... Um, clickbaity type um i forget the word that you used but the exciting like oh snake bit my arm off type thing yeah that, that stuff is factor. so yeah shock factor yeah that that stuff is easier to gain views and gain subscribers and all that stuff and uh, i personally hate it i i don't think it's helpful at all and i i don't i don't see you doing any of that either it definitely means that it's harder to you know put your hand up and say hey watch my stuff like this stuff's pretty good too but i have a feeling that the, the internet is so new that we're going to drift back into something that's more appropriate than, you know, shock factor, bleeding and, and whatnot. Yeah, it's that consumer, right? That's going to be the one that dictates whether th that kind of video is the one that's getting shared or the one that's where someone's getting bit. And I, they talk that, about that a lot with economic and conservations, you know, spend your dollar where you want your conservation to go, but also spend your time as far as sharing the videos that you actually think are quality content, not just that shock factor. That's really, really important too. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so at home, you have some animals. I see, obviously, you have the monkey tail skink uh, junior running around uh, behind yeah. you there. And, but before we started recording, you said you have 19. Did you mean 19 monkey tail skinks? or? I do. I have <laughs> um, four circluses, which is the family groups of monkey tails. Right now, I have a friend in Florida taking care of most of them because we're about to go in winter. And I literally just moved to Chattanooga. I did a bat blitz here last year, fell in love with the place, and I was like, I'm moving there. So they're in Florida until I can find an establishment that I can have them all set up. I also have a lot of creepy crawlies, some bird eating, the Goliath bird eating tarantula and some other tarantulas. Love the vinegar runes. And I have some cave scorpions, those whip scorpions, you know, the Harry Potter spiders. Yeah, yeah, Loved. yeah. Uh, lots of co cockroaches. My manager, my landlord is probably going to be watching this or listening to this and be like, what? She has what in her apartment? <laughs> but um, yeah, I just try hey, to. Hey, it said I have pets. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. It said no dogs, no cats. It didn't say things yeah. that will make people squirm. I think every reptile person knows how to read between the lines on uh, apartment <laughs> leases. <laughs> Find like, that gray zone. Yeah. The other thing that I saw that you have done or, or are doing is um, you're eating some bugs. Yes. <laughs> Entomophagy. Um, I love it. So I went to... Asia. And I was blown away by how different their culinary, um, I guess, repertoire is. And that when I started reading about it, I realized that the US and like Western cultures are kind of the ones that are out of the norm when it comes to eating tarantulas and stuff, uh, <laughs> or any like bugs in general. Yeah. And so I think it's just absolutely fascinating that 
the things you learn, right? And how taboo something can be in one culture is completely acceptable in another. And that also just really kind of pushes that whole fear to fascination, myth busting, just because you think one thing doesn't mean that's the right thing. Yeah, well, and especially in Western culture, we're very soft with our food. Like we don't want to know where our food came from. We don't want like any hard bits and stuff that's soft. Like if you go to Asia or eat an Indian dish, for example, like you're going to find bones and whatnot in, 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 you know, a chicken dish or something. But in North America, it's like we don't want any of that. And people definitely, you get removed from the food in a way. And it's interesting that because actually insects are a very good source of, of uh, nutrition. Absolutely high in iron, B12, and they're incredibly sustainable, right? You, it takes not even like a fraction of the amount of resources, water, land that it takes to raise chicken or cattle. And it can, they actually like to be in like these confined dark places. So you could bunch them all together and put them in a warehouse. And it's just crazy to me how we can let our perceptions even if someone tells you how nutritious something is and how uh, sustainable it can be, they're like, oh, but it's gross. I'm not going to try that. And so um, it's really unfortunate because I, I work with Exo Protein. If anybody wants to try some of their bars, it's super yummy. You can uh, call me up and I'll tell you all about them. But I just, I love that they're trying to push that envelope and we really need to find some kind of sustainable protein source. So is that um, exo protein, defeating. they make protein bars that are just using an insect protein source or is it protein cricket, bars? Or? Yeah, cricket, it's ground up crickets. <laughs> and taste wise, what is it like? You can't, you will, I promise, and I try to tell this to everyone, you, I promise you, you will not taste any, because Reptile people, you know how disgusting crickets can smell. Oh, yeah. That, oh, it's just terrible, right? But here, you, you, it tastes a little bit like, like an almondy taste. Interesting. Yeah, I think I've, well, I've had crickets before like as a, like a little salted cricket thing. I, I think I've had one in my whole life, but maybe I'll have to get into that protein powder or protein bars and whatnot. Cause, and I even saw that they had like, you had like cro um, cricket brownies. Yeah. Um, so I, they, you can buy the cricket powder itself and I will cook with it. I bake with it. I put it in my smoothies. Um, I have completely eliminated any kind of mammal meat. I'm just about completely finished with poultry. And so really insects have become a, a major food source, uh, protein source for me along with plants. Is that something that you do on a weekly basis, like eating uh, insect protein source? Yeah. Um, so I use all of Exo Protein's bars. Um, they have like brownie bar, they have a peanut butter and jelly, banana bread, muffin, blueberry muffin, like a wide variety. So I always have those stashed in my bags when I do hiking or my travels. And then I have the actual powder that I will bake with. And it just adds a bunch of protein to it, which is really nice. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I could definitely see it catching on, especially because as you say, the, the taste is not uh, offensive in any way and you actually can't even it's not like you're eating crickets it's ground up it's in a powder you there's no way to tell right and i actually cook with like mealworms and wax worms and those kinds of um, um little grubs and stuff as well and i'll put those in stir fry and that sounds super strange i know but once you get past that gross factor then it's like like cooking up an egg or doing one of those kinds of things yeah, as well. It's, it's all perception. Like you said, like we're, we're in the Western world. We're just so not accustomed to that, that it just looks uh, completely right, you wrong. You got to think of like, what is yogurt? Which is like, what, yeah. like disgusting milk culture or yeah. cheese um, even or any of those. Yeah. Or like, and mayo. I mean, mayo just sounds really gross. So um, <laughs> yeah. once we kind of dive in and if you think you would never eat crickets, you got to think that, USDA allows like a certain amount of bugs in our food anyways as contaminants. So you're probably, I've already eaten about half a pound of bugs in your life already. Yeah. And you're totally fine. Exactly. You're probably healthier because of it. So the other, one other th thing that you had posted on, I think Facebook or Instagram, that was really interesting. I don't know if, how much you can talk about it is that that looked like a virtual reality. It was like a turtle in your oh, the sea it, turtle thing. Yeah. The, yeah. What is that? A, um, it's AR, um, I think it's artificial reality, something like that. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a new program. I'm working with a few different um, people. 
some engineers and some creators to create that as part of for teachers and for classrooms to get kids more excited. Um, but there's tons of other businesses and organizations that are doing that. So if that is something that you're kind of wanting to implement in lessons plans, uh, they do offer it for free, some of them. And there's also things you can just go online and kind of download the program and they have some pre-made animals already. So, so how does that work? Are you wearing virtual reality goggles or, or like those glasses or you're just like, it's just looking at a screen and you're seeing and you can kind of manipulate the image because for those people that are listening that I'm not, I'll put it in the show notes so you can see but it, it essentially just look like uh, a very realistic guess, looking turtle floating in your living room or something. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's part is on the phone. And so you have the animal, you can either see it against a white screen or a black screen, and you can move it around, and you can zoom it in, and you can kind of see all the details of the animal, or you could put it into a surrounding, I guess. And that's what um, this program does, where you have it on your phone, and as you're looking through your phone, you can see that turtle kind of be placed in whatever scene that your phone is, all, your camera is already seeing. So what's the name of that program? Um, I honestly don't know. I just, the, the creator sent it to me, um, oh, okay. but I do know someone told me, um, it's very similar. If you just Google, I think it's like green sea turtle, the Google will throw up an AI type of link that you can do the same thing. Okay. Well, I'll, we'll look, I'll, I'll find it and I'll put it in the show notes for people that they can find it too. Cause I'm yeah, sure it's super the, fun. Really it engaging. Looks so cool. Yeah. Yeah. What an interesting way to, to bring animals into it. But I'm, I'm sure it, it is the idea that it keeps the scale of the animal as well. So when you post, when the animal's appearing in your room, that it kind of looks the size that it would look. Right. So a lot of times on these videos and stuff, we don't, and pictures, we don't have that, that scale that we can kind of compare it to. And when you are able to see how big this animal is, it just gives you a whole different perspective. Kind of like when you're on the beach with the actual, actual sea turtle and you're doing these measuring things it allows you to have that awe factor without that shock factor. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, future plans for you. What, what, what do you, do you have some things in the works or do you have, uh, if you can talk about it, if you still have things that you don't want to talk about, but what do you have on, sort of on your plate for the future? Sure, I have lots of different things. Um, I actually had a children's nature show. Unfortunately, it fell through because the FCC cut their hours um, for children's programming. Um, but so I'm still working on that. And I'm working on three YouTube video series. That one will be a vlog where you go on the adventures with me, where we're following around these scientists for the My Backyard Explorations. We're doing one that kind of explains the fear to fascination, science, kind of that icky, gross stuff in nature through scientific experiments that kids can do in their own homes. And then we are, I'm also creating these um, backyard adventure kits where people can take this kit if they've never been outside really exploring before or they want to get connected but they just don't know how you would take these kits and it's basically a step-by-step -step kind of how to as far as observing and getting your hands dirty and what to look for and those kinds of things oh that's very cool yeah it's um it, so is that all on on gonna be on the youtube your youtube channel once you start mm -hmm. publishing everything will be on youtube and then we're also um going to be starting a patron do you have one of those I don't yet. I, I've tossed up the idea uh, of doing that at some point, but I feel like once I do that, I have to commit to something and I'm not sure what I, I want know. to commit to. <laughs> I, hate, I hate work commitments. Um, yeah. I'm the, in the same boat, but um, if we can get this patron going as well, then uh, we'll be able to start giving these kits to classrooms and, and kind of putting this on a big scale. But my, my biggest hope and dream is to become like most other conservationists, to become an asset in conservation and in wildlife education so so when you go out to these places like are you you're the one that's doing the filming and everything right like you bought yourself a nice camera and, and you go out and take the shots and and come back and edit it it's a one woman show yeah after the production team i should say and yeah. uh, that's something that should be actually said and i'm sure you can agree you go out and you buy all these fancy equipment and you end up just using your cell phone because it's convenient. So don't oh, yeah. think that you have to have all these crazy tools. I wasted, I didn't say wasted, but I spent the money on them. I hardly use them now. And I just use my phone everywhere. And some people are a little weird about talking into your phone. But I mean, it's your story to tell. And it's, it's going to be raw and you just got to do it. So if the cell phone's the easiest thing for you, then do it. 
Yeah, that's so true. The The cameras and phones are really becoming incredible. And there's uh, some really good apps that you can use for filming. And you're right, it is so much easier than trying to master a complicated camera and the phone just fits in your pocket and you're good to go. I know. And I'm always so worried about like we were doing the hellbender work and I had my camera and the camera's super expensive. And I was like, all I, and I'm the biggest klutz possible. So all I could think about was ruining my camera. So I just made sure I had my phone and a GoPro and it turned out to be a great little adventure. And you went, was that in, was it, you were just in a temperate rainforest. I think, was that in Portland or Oregon or? or, or it was, yeah. yeah. Have you been? No, I've never been, but I've been to Vancouver, which is in Canada on sort of the West Coast and this similar uh, temperate rainforest in, in there, uh, sort of on Vancouver Island. And it is uh, a really amazing experience. Yeah, it's, I've, I, me personally, and I know it sounds terrible because I'm supposed to be an educator and as an educator, we're supposed to know all this stuff already, but I had no idea we had rainforest in the U.S., which sounds so ignorant on my part, but I'm learning just like everyone else. And it was so, you, th this place is where you think that people created fairy tales because it was just so awesome. I saw about, you know, 35 slugs, which is what I went there for. It was to film slugs and it's just, I highly recommend it to everyone. Just go outside. I know I keep saying these are all life-changing experiences, but they really are. <laughs> well, yeah. And going into a rainforest, a temperate rainforest or a tropical rainforest is really, uh, it is a life-changing experience. It's something so peaceful and, and calming about being in a forest like that. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy how so many people think that we have to go elsewhere or somewhere exotic to see these really incredible things when really they're in our backyards if we just opened our eyes. Completely. And, and one, one last point that you kind of had touched on there was uh, as an educator, and I've ran into this as well, and you were kind of talking about the imposter syndrome is you do all of a sudden feel like, like once you start publishing content, you all of a sudden feel like you cannot um, have a question or not know the answer to something. You know, like you feel like you must know everything and, and it would be bad for you to ask. And it's totally not that at all. No. Um, and I still have that imposter syndrome. And it's... Um, I guess you're going to be your worst critic. And if you can come off and realize that you're not going to be an expert in anything, and I don't ever try to come off as an expert in anything, um, and just be more like a reporter, like, a, like what you were saying about your podcast. It's a conversation. So as long as you can have those conversations, then I think you'll be in the okay, unless you want to be an expert. But totally. No one likes to be talked down to. No, it's better to <laughs> ask questions and learn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on today, Mallory. I think you shared a ton of awesome information. And, and anybody that, because there's so many people that are in that boat that are just like us that want to do something with animals. They just don't know how they're going to do it. And they don't have a university degree to back them up. And they're not sure. So I think you really shared some sort of inspirational messages and, and kind of give some people some good pointers to, to sort of get through that. And um, so thank you for sharing that. And I'm really excited to see what you come up with in the future. That's going to be uh, very exciting. So can you let everybody know where they can find you online? Sure. So MissMalleryAdventures.com. Miss is MS. Um, you can see on the website, I'll have blogs up and some education stuff. But I am most active on my Instagram, which is MS period Mallory Adventures. If you guys have any questions, oh my goodness, I know that I was completely lost when I wanted to start this and I had no one to turn to. Uh, definitely reach out to me. I answer everyone. I take... I just, I know what you're going through. So just know that you're not by yourself. And I put up quizzes there. So again, I think a biggest thing, a big thing too to remember for um, in this realm is to support each other. A lot of us think that we're competing and we just really got to support each other. There's enough room for all of us. Completely agree. Yeah. The internet <laughs> is a vast place. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I know I kind of spieled on, I'm, I'm so excited. This is my first podcast interview. So thanks. No, for it was a pleasure chatting with you. And I, I appreciate all the spiel. It was fantastic. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. All right. That is the end of that episode. Thank you very much for listening. And if you are someone who is in the same boat as Mallory and I, in other words, you don't have credentials behind your name and you want to have a animal centered life, there are ways to do it. Don't let the fact that you aren't a certified person from a university or, or a school of some sort, don't let that stop you from pursuing your dream of working with animals. 
Not having credentials behind your name is not a good thing or a bad thing. It just is what it is. And there are certainly ways around it. You just may have to get a little bit creative, but there's definitely ways for you to get involved with animals in some capacity, even if you don't have the letters behind your name. And of course, Mallory, thank you so much for joining me for the hour. I really enjoyed that conversation. And I know with certainty that you've inspired some people to pursue their dreams working with animals. Don't forget to go check out customreptilehabitats.com, especially if you're in the market for something new. They have leopard gecko and bearded dragon complete kits with caging, substrate, lighting, everything you need there, as well as they have products like BioDude, Miss King, Universal Rocks. Everything you need is there. Definitely go check them out. Link is either in the show notes or in the description on YouTube. Thank you so much, guys. I will talk to you next time.